Hi, I'm Doug McKenzie, and on this week's FinTech Show, we're actually going to be looking into the consequences and the opportunities that surround PSD2. We teamed up with Maniga to find out what they're doing to help banks be compliant with PSD2, and spoke with Barclays, BPCE, and Swedbank to see what those banks are doing for their customers in the post-PSD2 world. Firstly, Ali Patterson sat down with Catherine McGrath from Barclays to find out what the exact differences were between open banking and PSD2. So firstly, open banking is driven from the Competition Markets Authority and it's very focused on current accounts, both retail and SME. Um, and it's already live, which is great. PSD2, in terms of the data sharing piece, is more September 2019 and it's savings accounts as well as current accounts and credit cards. Um, some of the rules are still slightly different. So with the CMA, it's all through secure APIs. With PSD2, there's still quite a bit more breadth in terms of screen scraping um, that's allowable. Banks will spend a, a huge amount of resources making sure that they maintain compliance. Being prepared for open banking, how different is that from a sort of regulatory perspective to PSD2? If I'm entirely honest, I see it as it's all one big uh, program from our perspective. So um, uh, our preparedness is the same and it's just that the deliveries, some were batched in January 13, some are coming later this year and then some are 2019. So we need to make sure our colleagues can explain it really well. We need to make sure our customers understand um, the choices and opportunities that they've got and we obviously need to make sure the technology works beautifully. I sat down with Johan Draghi Fjardel, the CMO of Maniga, and he was telling us about his predictions for the banking industry as a whole and how PSD2 and open banking is going to change that. PSD2 and, and more generally the, the, the whole open banking regime has the potential to fundamentally change the way we consume financial services. So everything from who is offering us financial services, uh, whom do we trust to advise us on financial services, and ultimately, what kind of products and services is it that we are, we are exposed to? So, for example, I mean, from a consumer perspective, although I think the change will be gradual, I think over time we'll get more used to um, other parties and banks potentially offering us or advising us on financial services. Companies like telcos, potentially the tech giants that are already sort of moving gradually into financial services like Facebook, Apple, Amazon. Um, but I also think in terms of product, I think... Uh, Financial services based on aggregated personal finances uh, are going to be, be more commonplace. So an example could be uh, a financial advisor that uh, you know, automatically notifies you when something happens in your personal finance situation. So uh, imagine you having an app that tells you every time you have an, an, an unusual spend in a particular category, or when your balance is close to zero, or when you're in a situation where you need a particular financial product, you know, it's a more personalized, you know, notification-driven experience. I spoke with Lotte Lovin from Swedbank about their perspective on regulation in 2018. I think that in the Nordic markets, the open banking will kind of continue the journey we are already into, where, where banks are uh, becoming some kind of ecosystems. Uh, and I see open banking as three things. It's a um, technology solution and the opportunity for us to aggregate data to become the, the full uh, financial uh, provider for our customers. It's also a, a possibility to distribute our services through others and it's an opportunity to find collaborations with fintechs and others to uh, really create good services to our customers. But on the other hand, I think that going outside of the Nordic markets and some of the other more uh, mature European markets, this will become something rather dramatic. Uh, but uh, that depends on where you are in your matureness and digitalization journey. Leia Jacobiak met with Francois Perrault from BPC to find out more about their partnership with Maniga. We just announced today that we were uh, partnering with Meniga, we basically chose their PFM solution, personal finance management solution, and Meniga will be the provider for uh, uh, account aggregation, transaction categorization, uh, notification of uh, you know important financial events, insights on expenses and uh, revenues, all that which is um, designed to be um, useful. Uh, practical, simple for customers will be basically uh, invented by Mediga and will put it on our 
large customer base. So this is what we decided to do. I was interested to see how other banks were responding to PSD2 and incorporating fintech solutions. In my opinion, uh, banks need to think of themselves as a platform. Uh, and think about what Amazon have done with their business platform-wise, what uh, Facebook and others have done, and try to emulate that. So the first thing you need to do uh, as a bank is really to get in control of your data. And in the case of open banking, it's about people's personal finance data. So you need to consolidate all of the transaction data, whether it's credit, debit, or account data, into a repository where you can really build uh, an innovation platform. Uh, and once you have that in place, you can use that strategically. You can use it to innovate in your own digital channels. You can use it to innovate with third parties, which I personally think you know, banks need to do both. Um, a good example of a bank that's really taking the whole platform co concept uh, to its heart and, and is, from what I can tell, determined to become a best-in-class banking platform is BBVA. If you look at the BBVA API marketplace, they're developing um, API endpoints that go well beyond uh, what PSD2 is demanding. So it's not just about account data. You know, they have things like um, se segments of their customer base that are pre-approved to some of their products. They're developing market insight data based on aggregated transactions. So lots of innovative, enriched data, uh, which, of course, they can choose to use themselves, but also choose to allow third parties to innovate solutions uh, on behalf of their customers. Um, and what's interesting, I think, about that, and I think about anyone that's doing this, is that you could uh, monetize some of that enriched data. You could choose to give it away for free to, to, to allow more innovation. But it's a strategic decision. But having the platform is the first step. Um, but it's also, it's not just about the platform, it's not just about getting third parties to innovate, it's also what you do with it yourself. I mean, take Amazon as an example uh, and their platform strategy. They allow others to innovate, but they also defend their own uh, customer touch point. They don't uh, neglect their own channel and the same applies for banks. You need to be a good platform, but you also need to truly transform the digital channels that you have if you're going to compete in, in the long run in an open uh, banking economy. As customers get more educated and potentially concerned about what they can do with their data, I wonder whether as a consumer I'll take that thinking and apply it into completely unrelated parts of my life. So I would love it if someone came up with something that said, Catherine, all the permissions you've given to all the apps that are sucking all the data and things that you're doing, actually you can have it in one place, you can turn it on and off and you can control it. So I wonder whether the controls that we're getting around financial services data will start to move into controls around other data in my life. It will also, I think, require us to work differently in the banks. And we are, for example, we are now taking a step in uh, changing how we work with development, business development. So we have just recently uh, swifted uh, the whole bank to work in an agile model. So uh, we have gone, we don't have any projects anymore or any kind of waterfall way of working. So in all parts of our company, we work agile and uh, in value streams with cross-functional teams in a very modern way. Um, and that is a good way to prepare ourselves to be flexible when things are moving very fast and also to be an attractive employer for the young people uh, with a new kind of skills that is needed to take on this journey in a good way. And we also have changed our way of working with development. So we now work all over the bank in agile value streams. So all our investment plans are done like that. Uh, and everyone working in value streams are kind of responsible for ensuring that they are flexible, speeding up, delivery. Every week we are delivering new topics. Banks in, in many ways are, are even better positioned because when you think about it, the, the, the top three, four banks in any market, uh, they have uh, consumers at scale on their platforms. They have all of their financial data already in place. So, you know, um, in some sense, you could say the game is on. The question is just who, who is going to play. The challenger banks and the fintechs, I think, are in some ways the ones that will benefit the most initially because they have the products, they're ready to go. They don't quite have the scale that, uh, that some of these other players we've mentioned have, but, but, they, uh, but they certainly have a lot to gain. And I think you know, their playing ground has suddenly become more interesting. 
And if you look at, for example, the UK, I mean, the UK is a little bit ahead of the curve when it comes to open banking. And you look at guys like Monzo, you look, like, you look at uh, Starling Bank, uh, or more broadly, you look at, at Revolut, which is sort of you know, cross-country. Uh, these guys have a lot of momentum. Uh, many of them have just, uh, have just uh, raised more funding. Uh, they have a lot of wind in their sails in terms of customer adoption. Monzo, I think, have around half a million customers. Revolut have surpassed one and a half. Um, so, so you know, and, and these guys, you know, what PSD2 does for them, it really opens the opportunity to build more personalization into the customer experience. And that brings up the opportunity of market pay, marketplace plays. So, you know, these guys offering, you know, other people's financial services to their customers, um, you know, at a, at a commission. So I would say in the short term, watching um, the challenger banks in the long term, it's going to be very interesting to see what banks do, but equally what, uh, what the tech giants that are dabbling in, in financial services are going to do. The most important thing for us in this is to ensure that we are a good collaboration partner for third parties and others, and that we are really good in integrating things between our, us and others. It shall be very easy for our, uh, to work with us for third parties, as well as being the best bank to be a customer in. PSD2 is an opportunity for us, and we will launch Fidor, which is a, a company we acquired uh, just um, one year ago. We launch it in France, and we will launch it not as a bank, but as a PSD2 provider, because it's easier, and because we want to be able to explore the opportunities uh, offered by uh, this new regulation. So my view is regulation is the same for everybody. Yes. So when it is a problem for us, it's a problem for everybody. Yes. And when it is an opportunity for us, it's an opportunity for, uh, for everybody. So large banks, uh, small fintechs, everybody is able to take advantage of um, the opportunities offered by these regulations. So we are really open to this uh, move, which is opening banking infrastructure to to a large number of people. Finally, we looked at how banks are still trying to retain that customer touch point now that open banking is a reality. I think they really need to redefine how they think about digital engagement. When you think about banking apps today, if you open up your banking app, what can you typically do? You can basically check the balance on your accounts. You can move funds from one place to the other, and if you're lucky, you can pay bills. But it's all very transactional. But when you think about how a bank wants to be perceived, they want to be perceived as trusted financial advisors. And so you need to create that kind of environment uh, digitally. What does that mean for the digital experience? You should think about how uh, companies like Facebook, Google, Twitter, and others are engaging in the digital channels and try to figure out like, how do we make that work for banks. Um, a good example is uh, Maniga's uh, financial activity feed, one of our sort of feature products which we recommend bank, our customers or, our, or the banks that we work with use as the entry point to the mobile app. So what the financial activity feed does, it, it mixes enriched transactions, uh, so categorized, merchant mapped, with notifications such as unusual spending warnings, uh, letting you know when you're low on your account, um, informing you when you're spending more than your peers in a particular category. So very actionable insights about how you can improve your finances. Also includes things like uh, you know personalized targeted offers from the bank and third parties. All of this mixed in with transactions. So it's almost like a feed of your financial life as it, as it unfolds. And every time you log in, you know there's new information, there's new advice, uh, and every sort of item in this feed is is an entry point to sort of more advanced functionality. So this is an example of how you can really build a digital environment that facilitates this daily contact or, or regular contact between the bank and its customer in an advisory fashion. So that, that's a good example. Another example is, is, you know, we've recently been very inspired by what Fitbit and Strava have done in the health sector. Really sort of get people to engage with data and, and, and use data to help motivate themselves to improve their health. And, and we've de developed similar tools for our clients to help consumers improve their financial health. Uh, and so these are the kind of thoughts and and innovations that banks need to bring to bear in order to improve the digital channels and create engagement that can compete with 
whoever is going to step into this space. That's the way that banking will be done in the future. So it's kind of how you will remain the most important bank to your customers to really embrace what's happening around you and the new technology. And open banking is actually the next step. PS2 was the door opener. Open banking is what will happen after PS2. So, uh, not embracing open banking is not an option for banks, I think. Um, this is the way forward. So if you want to remain the, the one customers prefer, you need to embrace the new technologies to ensure that you are delivering the service and functionality and capabilities that consumers uh, demand. How are you looking to use open banking to really ensure there's a lot of brand loyalty, and that level of transparency that banks so that you do not become a utility, a bit like what's happened with telecoms, arguably. So I think it would have been quite easy at the beginning to see it as a big threat and behave as an incumbent. So what we thought we'd do is really understand what our customers thought and what our customers wanted from it. Two things became really clear really quickly. One was they wanted to feel safe and secure, and if they felt like that, they would be very happy to engage with it. Now we have a, a great reputation for trust um, already, so we're doing things like the customer permission centre that helps customers feel even more in control of their data. The second thing is about designing with the customer at the heart. So customers say, I'm comfortable bank that you make a fair return in terms of my banking with you, therefore do smart things with my data and always be on my agenda. And I think if we continue to stand back and say, is the use of data always understood by the customer and always on their agenda, then I think we'll do really well. We have an awesome app already that gives me all the easy, frictionless things that I want to do. We also have fantastic colleagues who can help you when it's actually a bit complicated and you want someone to help you navigate through it. By making sure that our colleagues can see the same things that our customers can see, it means when I've got a question about my consolidated finances, then our colleagues should really be able to help. So we see the technology of open banking really enabling our colleagues to have better conversations with customers than they've been able to before, because we'll be able to see more of a customer's financial life. But I think it's also about going beyond that. Uh, one thing is improving your channels. The other thing is really building new propositions. Uh, and a good example of, a, of, I think, a very attractive proposition that banks have to date not, well, I shouldn't say ignored, but not done enough about is, is, is targeted uh, card linked offers. So what that means is that uh, banks with good scale, so say the top three bank in any given country, um, has the scale to attract uh, merchants to, to, to target their customers with, with offers. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's say we have a bank with 20% market share in any given market. Uh, they walk into uh, one of the leading um, sports uh, equipment retailers with uh, a segment of 200,000 consumers. These are basically people that spend uh, more than average on sporting equipment, but they're not shopping with this particular merchant. Now, the proposition is that you as a merchant can have access to these consumers through the digital bank, but your price is to give them a deeper discount than you, than you would normally give, uh, and then maybe a small commission for the bank. And then for the consumer, you get a, a very relevant offer, relevant to your spending profile. Uh, and all you need to do is to go out and shop with the cards that you have registered with the bank. Uh, and the bank accumulates the discount and then charges the merchant uh, once per month and puts the money into your account. It's almost like a, a win proposition for everyone. But it requires scale, it requires dedication and, and analytics. Uh, but that's an example of the kind of data-driven innovation that banks need to pursue to really take advantage of open banking. As you can see, it's still early days when it comes to PSD2 and open banking. Tune in next week when we find out more about security in the banking industry.